I, I really am humbled to be here in this room, uh, in this building, on this hill, and before this audience. Um, I, I really, especially when we start talking about Raphael Lemkin, am not in any way worthy um, to be associated with the incredible work that he did. Um, but really take my cue from him that it's not about me, it's not about any of us in this room, it's about the issue of genocide and our commitment to end it. So I'm going to try to share some ideas that hopefully will be of some use to you, um, and maybe we can have a discussion as we go further in the day, um, or further in the, in the program, uh, uh, to try to come up with some ideas to, to address um, what is one of the most intractable problems, uh, I think, in human history. Um, so I, I appreciate that. I want to uh, do a few thank yous to begin, and I have to start with uh, Representative Adam Schiff, who, uh, who is the, the host of this, uh, who, whose staff reached out to me to, to um, invite me, and, and who has been really a tremendous uh, human rights advocate. Um, uh, and I, I have to say, as a side, I, I'd wish you were here, because it would be a great compliment. But uh, when I, I was asked by one of my colleagues, what I was doing. Oh, I heard you're going to DC for something, and you know, what are the details? And I said, well, this is going on. Uh, Congressman Schiff, uh, Schiff uh, invited me, and she immediately stopped. You know, it will be awesome to meet Adam Schiff. She said, a great defender of democracy and one of my legislative heroes. So, even in Massachusetts, his work really has has had an impact, and people really take seriously the commitment he has. Um, and I think you know. Honoring Raphael Lemkin in the particular way that this event does is really important. It's not about remembering Lemkin for the past, but really how do we take his legacy into the present and future um, in our defense of human rights. Um, I, uh, I also want to um, uh, uh, recognize um, the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, Republic representative, uh, Robert Avedisian, who, uh, who is also a great uh, advocate for, for human rights protections. Um, for Armenians in that part of the world, and really as a model for other small peoples whose whose basic right to self determination um, is is a daily uh, a daily struggle. Um, so I appreciate very much that you're here. Um, the in defense of Christians uh, uh, head um, Tufik Baklini, um, who who has been doing really important work. Um, it, it, you don't have to read a lot of news uh, over the past few years to understand that, that uh, particular peoples um, in the Middle East, whether it's Syria and, and Iran, uh, Iraq and other places, really do face um, a, a, a situation that, that um, has become genocidal at points um, and, and uh, is, is really a horrific human rights um, challenge today. So I thank him for being here. And the doyen of, of this series and many other Armenian American uh, public interest programs, um, uh, Sue Aramian is here as well. And, and I want to echo the thanks for the, for the work you did to, to create this program, but also the, the ongoing commitment that you have to, to, I would say, Armenian issues within the broader human rights uh, perspective, which I think is really crucial. So thank you for being here. Um, and I wanted to thank as well, I know there are representatives from the Embassy of Armenia. I want to thank you for being here as well. And just as importantly, everyone else who is here. Um, if I don't know you now, I will, I will uh, meet you soon enough, I hope. And last thank yous uh, to uh, the Armenian National Committee folks, particularly Aram Hamparian, Teresa Yurimian, and Elizabeth uh, Chuljian uh, for putting this event together and for really being the kind of people who commit themselves um, tirelessly to, to um, the promotion of, of the, the safety and security of a vulnerable people. Um, great work. I should also mention surprise guest Rafi uh, Hamparian who, uh, who came in, uh, who also uh, has done a lot of ANC work but surprised us by coming in from LA. So I want to recognize his tremendous work as well. Um, and and uh, uh, Greg Stanton, uh, who's the former president of the International Association of Genocide Scholars, uh, uh, founder and, and leader of Genocide Watch, and uh, also creator of the eight, now ten stages of genocide you may be familiar with, um, and has done tremendous work in general, um, and now is at the George Mason uh, University Conflict Resolution Program. So, uh, and. Uh, Ambassador John Evans, who's going to come up later in my remarks, so I won't say too much about him, but, uh, but uh, you know, it's always a privilege to, to be in the same room with him and, and have a chance to, to see him again. And finally, Patrick Hare from Worcester State University, who is a tireless organizer uh, and, and has been really helpful in getting, getting me here and getting things together. So a lot of thank yous, um, and, and that maybe says something about what it takes 
to deal with the issue of genocide. Um, we, we, oh, wait a minute, I just realized Jim Fussell is here too. I'm gonna, great scholar of Raphael Lemkin. I just saw you walk in, I'm sorry. Um, thank you for being here as well. Uh, really a pioneer in, in uh, uncovering a lot of the material that, that we now um, have as sources of, of Raphael Lemkin's work and, and has been a, a really tireless advocate for, I want, how do I want to say this, um, bringing Lemkin back into the public eye um, over the past 20 years where he had really languished outside of it um, and deserves a lot of credit for that. Um, I guess this is why the, the struggle against genocide is not a one person you know, sort of heroic effort. It takes a lot of people um, some of them are here today, some of them are you know, through the halls of Congress and, and beyond. Um, and, and I think that's something important to keep in mind. Um, we do have a challenge. Um, the world is very different from Lemkin's time. He died in 1959. It's different, and yet genocide is still a fundamental, incessant problem that we face. Um, never again, and I know people talk about this all the time, but never again really seems to mean ever again. Um, I, people talk about the first genocide of the 20th century, used to talk about the Armenian Genocide. People realize, oh, that's actually the Herrero Genocide starting in 1904. But really, if you think about it, there was no first genocide of the 20th century or the 21st century because genocide was continuing from the 19th century to the 20th century into the 21st century. So our challenge is not that we occasionally have to deal with genocide. Our challenge is that genocide is so normalized in the world that we live in that we need to figure out how to address it at every moment. We need to try, to try to address that challenge. I'll give just a few maybe pointers and ways that I think about ways that we can do that in my remarks, but I hope to hear also from you, as I said before. Um, the pessimism, pessimism is hard to avoid um, now more than maybe any time in the past 50 years because we've had so much time to address this problem. It's a century after the Armenian Genocide. It's three quarters of a century after the Holocaust, the never again moment in human history. A quarter of a century after the Rwandan genocide, where we said, now we have the tools to deal with genocide, finally we're gonna stop genocide. Um, it's 68 years after the United Nations Convention um, on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide came into force. Um, and still, we're in the midst of genocide. The Rohingya are suffering genocide. We see conditions, um, depending on which scholar you're talking to, in Yemen that are genocidal. We know what ISIS has, has done and continues to do. And case after case, we see mass rape continuing in the, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and on and on. Um, we, we have a challenge. Um, but Lemkin, if there's one part of his legacy, in the midst of the darkest challenge, you can find also some things to hold on to that are, that are signs of progress. Okay, um, there, is, there is real hope. Um, took the US 40 years to do it, but in 1988, we did ratify the Genocide Convention. People pushed, people like Senator uh, Proxmire, who gave speeches every day for years and years and years to try to convince the Senate to, to ratify the, the treaty. Um, the first prosecution for genocide happened in 1998, 20 years ago. It's a major step forward, right? It took 50 years after the General Assembly first passed the Genocide Convention to get that conviction, but it happened. And what's happened since is there have been more convictions, okay? It's after the fact, it's not prevention, but it's an important start. Accountability for genocide is a crucial piece, crucial part of the UN Convention and a crucial, crucial piece of genocide prevention. Um, we've had, depending on your, your perspective, um, a key intervention in Kosovo that involved military, uh, a military action, but also a key intervention in East Timor, both in 1999, that didn't involve military action, quite the opposite, I'm gonna talk about that later on, um, that actually stopped uh, the second half of a genocide, or a, I would consider a genocide from happening. Um, and Congress itself uh, has taken the initiative uh, last year to pass the Elie Wiesel Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act. Um, and this is laying the groundwork for a more systematic and robust U.S. response to genocide. I'm gonna to touch on that in a little bit of, of detail later on because there's still a lot of work we need to do, but that's, that's a start, uh, an important starting point um, for, for this government. 
We also see um, a number of transitional justice um, initiatives that have had some impact. Um, if we think about 20 years ago, um, Australia, Governor Australia, published the Bringing, uh, Bringing Them Home report, which is almost 900 pages of careful analysis, testimony, documentation, and so forth of the, the um, uh, forced removal of Aboriginal children in the 20th century and actually back in the 19th century from their parents, which the Australian government itself concluded was an act of genocide. Um, and that has had dramatic, a dramatic impact on Australia. When you go to Australia today, you see um, evidence in museums and other contexts where the society is trying to grapple with this, this Aboriginal history and trying to address um, the horrors that were inflicted on, on its indigenous population. That doesn't mean there haven't been backlashes, there haven't been backslides in Australia, but this is an important moment that, that serves as a really important model. Um, Armenia, the Ar governor Arme Ar of Armenia has hosted three global forums against the crime of genocide since 2015, um, bringing global policymakers, leaders, um, and, and scholars together to try to think together about what is necessary to stop genocide. Um, in the 21st century. Uh, and this is important because you're getting people talking together who have their expertise and their commitment, getting them in the same hall, in the same room, in the same context to try to figure out ways to address this very difficult problem. Um, on the scholar side, um, oh, I should mention that Guatemala has had a truth commission uh, following its genocide. Canada has been working with the Truth Commission to deal with its residential school removals of, of um, First Nation peoples. Um, and again, there are, there are, you know, depending on who reviews these, there are, there are shortcomings. But these are important steps forward in recognizing that genocide has happened and that it needs to be addressed in a significant way. Um, we've had the International Association of Genocide Scholars since 1994. We have multiple journals in the field. We have other now genocide uh, scholars organizations. This is an important step forward to identify the importance and the need for having sustained academic research focus on the issue of genocide to try to come up with reliable objective analyses of the problems, of the histories, and the contemporary challenges, and um, solutions. Um, in an academic uh, context that's away from policy pressures, away from political pressures. Um, we have things like going in more into the policy side of things, preventing genocide, a blueprint for U.S. policymakers, otherwise known as the Albright-Cohen report in 2008. And although I'm highly critical of the report for in, in a lot of its aspects, it was a really important step forward for the United States to start thinking how do we, again, address this problem in a realistic, policy-oriented way that can actually work with the, the, the realities of the U.S. government. And that report, you will see, for anyone who, who knows that report and knows the Elie Wiesel Act of 2018, you can see that that act um, is, in, for the most part, adapts some of the key recommendations of the 2008 report. So here's a case where scholars and policymakers got together, came up with a set of ideas, and within 10 years, those ideas actually became a legal requirement for how the US government would operate in relation to genocide. Um, and uh, again, there are, there are many more conferences, many more attempts in academia and policy circles to deal with the issue. Um, one of the really important aspects of what's happened in the last 20 years is the recognition of sexualized violence as a part of genocide um, and the role of gender. Um, which was de-emphasized historically. In fact, if you go to testimonies and eyewitness accounts of the Armenian genocide, you will find um, a, a chilling amount of sexualized violence, sexual enslavement um, of girls and women, and actually boys and men in some cases, um, that's there. But you will see it in the margins. You will see it sometimes very euphemistically referred to, obliquely referred to. Okay. The Holocaust for a long time, scholars really didn't talk about, and, and many claimed that there wasn't an issue of sexualized violence and enslavement so forth in the Holocaust. We now know that that's not true, quite the opposite. There were even systematic uh, uh, enslavement systems in the concentration camps, uh, forced prostitution systems, as well as rampant sexualized violence. Um, and in case after case after that, whether you're looking at Bangladesh, where systematic rape 
was a fundamental part of what was happening. Um, the, we could argue, arguably the first time we saw organized rape camps as part of a genocide. Um, and on and on. We go through, uh, obviously, Bosnia, um, Rwanda, Sudan, um, and to ISIS and the Rohingya and, and others today. And we see the same patterns of, of rampant sexualized violence. What's so important is the Akiezo, uh, Akiezo uh, conviction in 1998, that first conviction for genocide, and this is incredibly important, was a conviction um, that included, as an act of genocide, the ordering of rape um, as a tool of genocide. So at the beginning of real case law on the genocide in the international community, sexualized violence was recognized as an important component, and we can't under, un underscore that. We have a long way to go, both in dealing with genocide and sexualized violence, but it is really important to understand that. Um, we also see um, the significance of LGBTQ plus repression as part of genocide. It's been long known that that was an element of the Holocaust, um, but we see various um, uh, aspects of human rights abuse, for instance, in Uganda, where systematic um, uh, assaults on, uh, uh, violent assaults and uh, coupled with legal and other uh, uh, assaults on, on the rights, dignity, and lives of, of um, members of the LGBTQ plus community um, are under assault. Um, and this is something we need to be very attentive to as a component of genocide, and we're starting to see that. Um, important work of, of scholars such as Alyssa von Jordan Forge um, have really uncovered um, what some people call seeing rape as a tool of genocide. Um, and this is, a, this is an important way to understand that the violence that happens in genocide is not disconnected from other kinds of violence. Um, it's not a discrete kind of violence that's different from everyday violence. It's connected in some way. It's important to realize that. In fact, I've argued um, that in addition to genocide being a tool, uh, uh, rape being a tool of genocide, that genocide can be viewed in, in many ways as a tool of, of rape, of sexualized violence. Not only if we look at why perpetrators become involved, you can see this in the Armenian case, if you look at ground level perpetrators and their motivations um, that we can sort of uh, uh, glean from, from testimonies for, for participating in the Armenian genocide when they weren't ideologically motivated particularly. These are more ground level perpetrators. Um, the, the ability to engage in sexualized violence, the ability to actually have women and girls as slaves um, was a key motivating factor. And we see this again in the case of Bosnia um, among Serb perpetrators when you look at testimonies and in other cases as well. That sexualized violence is a, is a driving force and that rape culture itself um, can actually be a driver of genocide. Um, and what I would argue, um, we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out in the past few decades why people commit genocide. How can people commit this level of violence? What does it take to turn someone from an average person into a killer? Because time and again, what we find out with genocide is that it's average people. It's not just the, the ideologically driven or otherwise motivated leaders who you know, have a huge impact on, on shaping a genocidal process. But without average people participating on the ground level, genocides don't happen. And what causes them to be involved? How can they commit this violence? And we're, we're somehow astounded at this. But when we start looking, and this is true of the United States and other societies as well, at the everyday violence that's already happening, it becomes a, a lot easier to understand. If you look at cases in which people are willing to commit rape, domestic violence against vulnerable people, who murder um, people in our society, you know, vulnerable people, right? Racist attacks, gendered attacks, and so forth. It's no wonder there are people who are willing and already really trained to commit genocide. When they're suddenly given the green light and the freedom, there are no laws against what you're doing anymore. You don't have to hide it, you can do whatever you want. It's no wonder there are people ready to participate in genocide. And that should give us pause. Um, as Alyssa von Jordan Forge has actually argued, the level of gender violence within a society is the best early warning we have of genocide. And more uh, recent uh, statistical work by political scientists like um, Hudson and, and others has actually shown that to be true, that the best predictor, predictor of, of mass violence and, and conflict 
is the level of gender violence and discrimination in a society, not the level of religious and other kinds of and ethnic and so forth repression. So something for us to be very worried about. Prevention of violence against women is prevention of genocide. Um, Lemkin was attuned to these kinds of issues. Um, he was aware that genocide was not the sort of simple, reductive framework of, of, of one-dimensional hate, but that it operated in very complicated ways, um, and that it often targeted, um, we can say this, reproductive um, aspects of, of a victim group that really inhered in attacks on women and girls. So we understood that. Um, I wanted to say, uh, I, I mentioned the Elie Wiesel Act uh, before, and I want to say how important that is. Um, it really, for the first time, commits the United States to having a clear process for dealing with genocide. We all know it's very easy to condemn violence when it's happening. It's easy to look at reports and say these things shouldn't be happening. It's a very different thing to figure out how to actually move a complicated bureaucratic apparatus to deal with it productively. And what we have seen historically, um, and you can, you can make your judgments about the motivations behind this, but what we have seen is with the United States and other world community members, the movement is very slow. In the case of Rwanda, the change that needed to happen in attitudes and, and um, actual governmental functioning took much longer than the genocide itself took to wipe out 800,000 people. And so what this act does is create a pre-existing structure to deal with genocide once we identify that it's happening. It remains to be seen if that law is more than an ideal, more than a hope, if it's a real shift in the way that the US government will operate, but it for the first time creates the mechanisms to actually have that impact. Um, another important aspect is, and this is where it goes beyond the Albright-Cohen report, is that it talks about transitional justice as being crucial to genocide prevention. Okay? Transitional justice, many of you are familiar with it, some of you are experts far more than I am on it um, in this room. Transitional justice, for those who aren't familiar with it, is what you do after genocidal or other kinds of violence to reestablish for the victim community but also for the perpetrator community some kind of semblance of, of ethical and, and just sort of day-to-day -day functionality. How do you deal with the legacies of the past? How do you address the, the hatreds that are still gonna be there in the perpetrator group? How do you transform that perpetrator group so that it can actually not, no longer have genocidal potential, right? How do you make sure that the victim group will actually survive in the long term? So transitional justice is key, but it's also key for two other reasons. One is that if you don't deal with those things, if the perpetrator group still has attitudes that are genocidal, one group is done, maybe. One group is no longer a threat. It will find another group. Some people argue in the case of Turkey, for instance, which really didn't go through any kind of process at the end of the Armenian genocide, that you can, and you can trace some of these elements out. You can actually trace the people who went from perpetrating the Armenian genocide into the Turkish Republic government up into the 1950s and beyond, who shaped the, the institutional um, culture of military, the military, of the economic system, of the government. And it's no surprise that decades later, the Kurds are another group that were targeted. It's no surprise that other, other groups ended up being victims of the same kind of fixed elements of genocide within the society. So addressing, you know, addressing the elements that end up being formed through the process of genocide. And we have to remember, genocide is not just the result of attitudes that pre-exist, it changes the society, right? It changes, you can see elements of this in, in Germany in the 1950s, and you can see it in today, where there are still elements of the Holocaust, despite incredible efforts by, I think, German society to deal with these, to, to expel these. There are still elements there. Um, and, and they come out in anti-Semitism, you know, sort of neo-Nazi anti-Semitism in East Germany, for instance, after reunification. And if we don't deal with all of these, there are potentials for violence in the future. We have to remember that. But also, in very simple terms, if we don't have a recognition that there needs to be a legitimate, serious, fundamental process for dealing with past mass violence that actually addresses the problems, and I would argue includes, includes 
a reparative process that means that the perpetrator group really needs to give up the gains of the genocide and assume responsibility for, for um, helping, for reconstituting the victim group as much as possible. Remember, it'll never be, you know, there's never any way to overcome the impact of the genocide. But without that, the message to other would-be perpetrators is absolutely clear. Genocide pays and you can just go on with it and no one will do anything about it, okay? But not only that, the benefits you get will be yours forever, okay? And, and we unfortunately see that again and again and again. Um, I look, you know, we're in the United States and I can't help but comment on genocide of Native Americans, um, land thefts, which are still contested, um, massive demographic destruction, so forth, that, that puts Native Americans today um, uh, into the category of really the most vulnerable. And I don't like to play the victim, I don't mean to suggest victim Olympics against African Americans or anything like that, but in terms of poverty rate, um, average lifespan, uh, vulnerability politically, marginalization, um, ability to be targeted by race, you know, public expressions of racism um, and, and other things. The level of vulnerability um, of Native Americans is striking. And a big part of that is we haven't actually dealt in a sustained way as a country with a legacy of, of, of genocides against Native American people. So I argue that's another part of why transitional justice is so important. It's important for us as a society. Um, I will add, it's not just about making the perpetrator group pay. It's not just about establishing some kind of abstract justice. It's about rehabilitation. The victim groups need support to survive. And unfortunately, we see again and again, particularly with smaller victim groups, the slow fading out of existence. Okay? I, I, I hesitate to say this, but when I look at Armenia even today, I look at the issues of emigration, I look at the economic vulnerability, the land vulnerability, and other issues, I have to wonder if as a legacy of the genocide, the dissolution of identity globally, will there be a viable Armenia in 50 years? Okay? And again and again, we see different groups who have faced genocide, who struggle for decades and centuries just to survive, and many don't. Uh, particularly indigenous peoples in North and South America, there are way too many peoples that have gone out of existence. And it's not just the immediate destruction, it's that long legacy where nobody comes in to try to save them. Um, so it's really important. Um, and to try to understand just how devastating genocide is, and I'm gonna take a moment here. I can, by the way, go three hours without taking a breath, so, um, and I know that's not, uh, except for fil filibustering uh, down here, that's not the way to go. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm doing okay, whoever is keeping time, okay. Um, I have some, some more comments, I wanna talk about Lemkin a little bit more, but I do wanna emphasize that the devastation of, of genocide is profound. Just thinking about the demographic destruction, the people killed, right, but when people are killed, that means their progeny will never be born. Right? But when groups are attacked by genocide, that also means that birth rates go down, even with among the survivors. When you have sexualized violence, that typically breaks up social structures, family structures. It makes um, having children much more difficult because of trauma and other reasons, right? So populations decline, not just from the direct killing, but from all the, the elements. And if there's one thing we know, you can be a big population in the world today and do horrible things and make all sorts of mistakes economically, politically, militarily, and overall you're fine. Um, I mean, you know, Japan, Germany, whatever, big populations, World War II, they came out of it, it was difficult, but they came out of it okay. If you're already a not huge group and you suffer genocide and you become a very small group, you have no leeway like that. Population numbers matter. They matter a lot, and genocide reduces populations, and that means it reduces political viability, economic viability, territorial viability. One of the great ironies of genocide is that when you think about reparations around land issues, for instance, Native Americans, Armenians, many other groups who have indigenous claims for land, um, one of the arguments against them having the land that they had in the past is that their populations are so low. But how did their populations get so low? They got low through genocide, right? So genocide actually becomes the justification 
for not for taking away land, right? It's a very perverse cycle that's very difficult to deal with. Um, so how do we how do we address that? Um, but there are identity issues. Being subjected to genocide is not just an, an aberration in your history, and it's done, and you go back to you know having a nice existence with good functioning social networks and business connections and in educational institutions, religious and spiritual institutions and so forth. Those are destroyed as well. People are dispersed. People lose language, they lose connection. And those weaken the viability of that group. You actually lose people as much from assimilation out of a group that has suffered genocide as you do in the actual destruction of the genocide. Right? Um, they're not dead, which is a good thing, but they're still the group itself, which was Lemkin's focus, begins to, to dissolve. Um, and I mentioned already the security, the, the, the vulnerability is crucial to understand when we think about the legacy of genocide. Genocide victim groups are condemned to a future of vulnerability and insecurity at every level, at the military level, at the political level, at the economic level. We can see that maybe easily, but at the identity level, at the self um, I don't want to say self-esteem level, that is the, the level at which um, people value their own identity, which has been radically devalued by others, becomes a challenge. Um, and on and on. Um, and so this transitional justice issue is really crucial, and that's why, even though it's a small part of the Elie Wiesel Act, I was incredibly thankful that it was part of it, because it, it gives us a tool to begin to understand that if we are going to intervene against genocide, if we're going to try to prevent genocide, when that fails, we still have as important a role to play. Um, and we can do that. Um, I want to say a few things about Raphael Lemkin as a sort of inspiration for us. I have to say, without Raphael Lemkin, is everybody, uh, maybe I should go, some of you might not be too familiar with him. Born in 1900 uh, in Lvov, um, uh, Poland, Polish Jew, um, who by the time he was a teen had been reading about cases of mass violence in history and, and had, who was struck that something was wrong, that no one was paying a lot of attention to these issues, but there was something there that was really important and wrong. Um, in his 20s, early 20s, and by that time he had studied law, was studying law, um, he encountered the Armenian Genocide. Um, and found out about it and we go into the details. Um, but, uh, but really um, was struck because it was such a, a, a well-known case in the world. It was reported on, remember, in some sense it's the first modern genocide, I don't mean by the techniques that were used, but because of the media coverage, the newspaper coverage, the sort of on the ground access people had to information about the Armenian Genocide while it happened and the trials and so forth after. Um, and what happened. It was a well-known event in its time. And he was very aware of the Simone uh, uh, Tellerian trial. We won't get into uh, all, the, all the issues with that. Uh, it's another story in its own right. Um, but in response to the, the lack of justice for the Armenian genocide, um, and remember, he's thinking as a lawyer, right? Somebody who's thinking we need law, we need, we need punishment and so forth to prevent crime. Um, he, he has this famous uh, remark. Um, in Turkey, more than 1.2 million Armenians were put to death. After the end of the war, some 150 Turkish war criminals were arrested and interned by the British government. Then one day, I read in the newspaper that all the Turkish war criminals were to be released. I was shocked. A nation was killed and the guilty persons were set free. Why is a man punished when he kills another man? But, why, but the killing of a million is a lesser crime than killing of a single individual. And that became his, his moment, right, to think we need to change that. And you can think of it, in a sense, as un identifying a gap in the law, sort of like we talk about with internet crime, you know, computer-based crimes, right? Our laws are always behind what's possible. Lemkin was facing a similar thing. Laws with, with the... With the 20th century and the, and the capacity for mass violence through, you know, I mean, gun, you know, small arms are weapons of mass destruction when they're um, organized the right way, right? Bayonets are weapons of mass destruction. 
When you have populations able to move, you have communications technology that can coordinate actions over a large geographical area among a large uh, a group of perpetrators, um, we start to have a scale of genocide happening very quickly that I won't say it was unprecedented because there have been, been you know, substantial genocides, but became a new normal, a new mode of, of modern violence. And our laws weren't keeping up. So Lemkin understood, sort of like we do with, with the need for, for keeping up with technological changes in our legal system, that something needed to change. Um, it's important that this happens before the Holocaust. Um, and it's really important, and, and, I'm, and I'm worried a little bit. I hope I'm going to characterize uh, in front of the Lemkin expert uh, correctly. But really for Lemkin, it wasn't, the Holocaust was really important for his final formulation of what genocide was and for his push for outlawing it. But he actually tried in 1933 to have genocide outlawed. He didn't have the word yet. He called it barbarism, um, which roughly equivalent to what we mean by genocide or what he would eventually mean by genocide. Um, but he already understood. Armenian case, cases from the ancient world to the present, indigenous groups, whatever, he understood what genocide was. He had the, the, the object, right? And he was finding a term for it, and it needed to be outlawed. Um, and here's a, a, a rather um, bitter foreshadow of the Holocaust. He was set to go to the League of Nations to present his bid for this law, but forces of anti-Semitism were decisive in preventing that, right? Within his own country of Poland, right? Among other things, people said, oh, he's a Jew claiming persecution. He's created this law that looks like it's a universal law, but he's really just trying to use it to advance his own people's interests, right? The exact opposite of Lemkin's thinking, right? Here's the guy of, uh, you know, a, 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 an example in history of someone who understood universal human suffering as well as anybody ever has, in my opinion, who could look through history and tie together group after group after group, form of suffering after form of suffering, violence, and so forth. Um, and because of anti-Semitism, he was reduced to a Jew who was cynically pursuing a law in his people's favor. I would have to say, if in his people's favor is a law against genocide, because they would be potential victims of genocide, that's actually not an immoral thing in my estimation, but that was how it was portrayed. The Nazis actually made fun of him um, as, a, as, a, as a figure, right? So anti-Semitism has a role in preventing what might have been at least, whether the law would have been passed, at least a, a new public discussion of genocide and a, a concept for the world to start to grapple with, which was pushed aside, right? Um, and so, you know, another lesson, he failed. And for him, I think the way he reports in his autobiography, that failure haunted him. Because within 12 years, 49 members of his family would be killed in the Holocaust. Very few would survive. Um, and somehow, he, he, he says this, somehow he felt like he failed them. That the fact that he couldn't get this law passed, I'm not sure that the law would have stopped the Holocaust. I don't think the Nazis were particularly concerned about international law. Um, however, it might have highlighted what was happening a lot earlier and created an international response at some level at a point where it might have been more helpful. For instance, taking Jewish refugees instead of turning them back and so forth, right? There might have been things that could have happened. But he really felt like he failed, right? That he couldn't find the right term, he couldn't make it catchy, whatever. Um, again, my take on this is this is the naive Lemkin early on in the 1930s just trying to figure out, hey, we've got to have this law, it's obvious. But, but not really having the, the political tools yet to figure out how to get that to happen. And also being in a context where the world community, where his own society and so forth, were, were not conducive to that happening. Jump forward, um, 1943, comes up with the idea of genocide, publishes in 1944. Um, and after World War II, he's involved in the Nuremberg trials he, and, and so forth. He begins pushing for a law against genocide. And by this time, he's learned some lessons. He becomes, um, I'll say it this way, sort of a Socratic gadfly, you know, Socrates who just uh, annoyed people into having to confront ethical, their own ethical uh, 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 shortcomings, okay? Lemkin was doing that for humanity. He was somebody who was, by many accounts, annoying, 
uh, overly persistent. Um, I mean, he would just buttonhole whoever he could. Um, he, he didn't care, you know, in no, like, in some sense, no shame. Not because as a person he was not humble or anything like that, I don't mean to suggest that, but because he was so driven by this point that we need a law against us. Look what just happened, right? I tried it in 1933, it didn't happen, and look what happened. If we don't have a law, it's going to happen again. Um, even with a law, it has happened again, but he understood that this was a crucial step. And he was a guy who just talked to whoever he had to talk to. I admire that. It's a kind of mental toughness I don't have. To be able to just find whoever might listen, and you can get ridiculed, you can get dismissed, you can get condescended to, whatever, by 100 people. But if 10 of them are willing to listen to you, that might just make a difference. And he did it through the UN in the late 1940s to get the genocide um, convention uh, uh, passed by the General Assembly in 1948. And then he continued after that with individual countries around the world. Whatever hook he could use, he was a master of many languages. He tried to, you know, he would find out different things about people to try to connect on a personal level. Um, whatever he needed to do to lobby. And you can see the difference, right? In 1933, he's thinking, I have this law, it's self-evident that this should be you know, a law of humanity. He goes through, he just expects everything to work correctly, and then political forces um, prevent him from doing that. By the 1940s and into the 1950s, he was a master at understanding those political forces and bringing about change. And what's important about that is, Lemkin was an ethical person who was operating out of an ethical imperative, but an incredible real politic actor as well. He didn't see those two things as separate. He understood that real politic is an ethical position, right? You, you use your political maneuvering, right, it, for good or bad. The decision you make about why you use it is the crucial issue. And he was able to connect those two things together. I want to say he had a kind of intrusive passion, right? He's a passionate guy, brilliant guy who didn't mind inserting himself wherever he could to make something happen. Um, and as hard as that is, as difficult as that is, um, it's sometimes the only way to advance um, the struggle for human rights. So we learn all sorts of le lessons from Lemkin, right? Be a political realist in a sense, but don't think that you have to give up your ethical commitments to do that. Um, it, it, it's, it, you know, there, there are many other things that come. What's sad about Lemkin is he has this success, right, which wasn't, I mean, I, I think, you know, he certainly had an ego, like, you know, all of us, I guess, and, and, and wanted, you know, this, his sense of himself got tied to the outlawing of genocide and the prevention of genocide, right? But as things sort of fade a little bit in the 50s, I mean, he continues advocating for genocide, but his life became really difficult. The health toll alone, and again, a, a, a cause for admiration. He had high blood pressure. He was incredibly poor. He lived, uh, I mean, everything he had went into advocating against genocide, um, and he was penniless in the, in the 50s. I mean, he survived by the good graces of others. Um, he, he, you know, high blood pressure. I mean, he didn't eat regularly in some cases. I mean, he, he, he really sacrificed everything. Right, in a heroic way. Um, and what the end of that was is he died in 1959, at 59 years old. Um, this incredible human being um, for whom seven people showed up uh, uh, at his funeral. Um, you know, I, before my time, but you know, now you would think he would get 500,000 people at a Lemkin funeral. And you know, there's a Lemkin street in Yerevan now. There are Lemkin, found out there are Lemkin streets in other places as well. Um, he, was, uh, he was actually um, nominated by Winston Churchill for the Nobel Peace Prize. I mean, he was known, but faded. Um, and maybe had he done, I mean, he was promoting genocide awareness and prevention, not Raphael Lemkin. And you can see the price of that, right? He didn't, he didn't put himself in a good position. Um, I'm not saying that's the model, but I am saying understanding that that's the commitment that he was willing to give means that I think each one of us in this room, when we're fighting against genocide, if we really care about that struggle, can give something, um, a little bit of sacrifice. Um, and I don't mean to, I don't, I don't speak as someone who's, you know, some great sacrifice. I mean, I, you know, it's something I have to remind myself all the time, that this is not easy stuff, it's not popular stuff, it's not stuff that you make money out of, 
um, or if you do, it's not good that you're making money out of genocide prevention. Um, it's difficult to do. Um, you can be you know, publicly humiliated in different circumstances. Those who have stood up to denial of genocide, for instance, will see that. Those who have struggled against ongoing genocides will, will have experienced that. But that's the sacrifice. If we really care about this issue, that's the sort of test we have to go through. This idea of mental toughness and courage that Lemkin had, um, this ability to, to deal with hostile audiences, again, maybe is something we can take with us. Um, he was also really uncompromising, um, but in a way that allowed him to negotiate with people. And I think that's another lesson, right? Uncompromising on the important things, right? That genocide is wrong, that we need to stop it, we need a law against it, and so forth. But willing to compromise in all sorts of ways, willing to work with whoever he could to try to advance that cause. For our era, um, how does this translate? And, and I'm thinking specifically, as I, as I wrap up, for those who are worried that I'm actually I'm gonna go three hours without breathing. Um, I, how does this translate for our reality? And I'm particularly thinking, we're in the US Congress. What does this mean for the US Congress? We have this law in the books. What can we do, okay? What does it mean for political leaders? There's actually some good things. I'll start by the bad side of things. Um, Daniel Firestein, uh, an Argentine scholar I, I admire quite a bit, has done some great work on, on genocide theory as well as practical issues in Argentina, um, argued in response to the Albright Cohen report that the big thing that it missed was that maybe the question isn't what should the US do more in regard to genocide, but what we should do less. Are there ways, when we look at our foreign policy, that we can stop doing things that promote in some way genocide, right? Can we look at the way that we sell arms or give military aid to countries and start doing an assessment of what's the potential these arms will be used for mass human rights violations, okay? I'm sure there are some Kurds in Turkey, Armenians in, in Karabakh and others who would welcome them. There are people all over the world who would welcome them, right? To start to think more responsibly about the impact that we have. And this really accords with something um, I actually think is the most uh, successful case of genocide prevention um, that we've seen, not just in the United States, but globally. And it happened through the initiative of three congressional leaders in 1999. Um, Jim McGovern, who's the Still the member from, uh, from Worcester, which is always exciting. By the way, it's Worcester, not Worcester, so give you a hard time. Yeah. Good, you're, you're getting it. All right, OK, all right. <laughs> um, and uh, at the time, Senator Tom Harkin um, and Senator Jack Reed. Um, and uh, I, I mentioned before this case of East Timor. Um, the East Timor genocide, we had a big role in 1975, without getting into the details. Um, East Timor is about to become independent, former Portuguese colony. Indonesia, it's, it's half of an island, the other half belonging to Indonesia. Indonesia, it's East Timor, 750,000 people. Indonesia, 200 million on, the, on that level. Um, well buttressed by the United States. It had already had a, a, a genocide against a people tagged as communists um, a decade before, supported by the US. Whole history of, of problematic human rights abuses decides we want East Timor. By the way, the side bar on this is there's oil in that area, so a theme that we will see again and again, but just to be aware of that. We, we, these people need to be part of Indonesia, okay? Um, and so Indonesia not only used its own military, but used um, local uh, paramilitary groups, right? Not very, if you think of it in Sudan, very similar to the Janjui militias, right? The unofficial perpetrators of genocide that the government can say are not our troops, okay? The Hamadian troops, that, this kind of thing, right? They're not our official troops. They're paramilitary, so we're not responsible. See it in Bosnia, um, Serbian, uh, Serbian paramilitaries in Bosnia, for instance, right? The Serbian government could claim they didn't have control of it again and again. Um, and they kill in, in a relatively, you know, in a few years, um, about 250,000 people out of 750,000. Okay. Numbers don't determine genocide, but the context in which that happened was genocidal, and that's a, that's a significant destruction. Um, during this time, um, Australia, Great Britain, and the United States were the worst offenders. Um, for us, Indonesia was a really important, remember, this is Vietnam era, 
was a really important anti-communist force in that part of the world. And so we were looking, willing to look the other way on a lot of stuff. Um, and we did on this. We didn't just look the other way. We actively stopped UN resolutions against what was happening. We actively provided diplomatic cover. Right? So when we're talking about the United States, we start to see, wait a minute, we contributed to a genocide. We can make the same case with Guatemala and other places as well. Right? But here's what changed in 20 years. So this goes on. There's some killing into the 90s. Finally, late 90s, the UN has gotten involved. The world community has gotten involved. OK, we need to solve this somehow. We need to let the East Timor people have a referendum for independence. They can decide. You want to be part of Indonesia? Great. You can be part of Indonesia. You want to be independent? You can be independent. You decide. Right? Self-determination, which we would consider a right for any group. Um, and as that st process starts to happen, the Indonesian government and its paramilitaries decide it's not going to happen. They're not going to have a referendum. And they start killing again, right? So you have this sort of hiatus in the genocide, but nothing done about the genocide. The same commanders are there, the same mentality, the same reason of state in Indonesia, the same leadership, and they're ready to start again. Congressman McGovern and Senators Harkin and Reid go to East Timor. And they ask people on the ground, what should we do? We understand what's about to happen. What can we do? And the response that Congressman McGovern reports, um, call off your dogs. What does that mean? You actually can control what the government of Indonesia does by how you engage it. And they took that message back. They figured out what it meant, right? We were, you know, not, I mean, the vast majority of weapons are coming from the United States, Australia, and Great Britain, who also got on board, right? The political support, ec massive economic aid, things like that, are going to Indonesia, right? That's an incredible power. The they came back and they convinced the Clinton administration, right? There are a lot of geopolitical things happening that made it the right time for this to happen. You know, we're post Cold War, there's a very different attitude towards what's going on. A lot of corruption in Indonesia with the aid that was going from the US and other. There, there are other reasons that support this, sort of uh, more, more fundamental. But they were able to change US policy, right? We withdrew our support, we withdrew the guns. The Indonesian regime collapsed. Uh, a new regime came in, and there was no genocide. This, to me, is the perfect prevention model, right? Don't send troops, right? Don't increase the level of violence in a place. Maybe that's unavoidable in some circumstances, but in this, it certainly wasn't. Withdraw the capacity of perpetrators to commit violence, and that's exactly what we did. And we stopped, in my estimation, a good 100,000 more people from being killed. Right? That is something the US Congress has done. Right? This is the model. Right? That doesn't show up in the Albright-Cohen report, for instance, Samantha Powers' 2002 book. This is very far away from any of that, because it obviously makes the US look bad in a lot of ways, but also ultimately good. Right? So how do we think of this kind of model? I want to give another model, and, and since he's here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point to Ambassador Evans. Um, there are other ways, right, we have seen bad US policies challenged in significant ways. For those who don't know, um, Ambassador Evans was the ambassador to Armenia um, in, the, in, the, in the 2000s. And uh, the policy of the US government has, has long been, there's one word you never use, right? Now let's remember Lemkin, for Lemkin, words matter a lot, right? He actually thought the reason the Holocaust happened in some sense couldn't find the right word. If he only could find genocide, catchy, catchy word for a variety of reasons, he would have had the public relations to stop, you know, to get this law passed and so forth. I think he's overstating it. But words do matter. People a lot of times say, well, we don't need the word genocide. Crime against humanity is fine, whatever. I disagree completely. Genocide is a particular thing, a particular kind of act with particular meaning, and there are times we need to use that word to make clear what's happening, why it's happening, what ex exactly is happening, and to, to spur us to do something about it. So Ambassador Evans, right, despite <laughs> be, you know, knowing he's not supposed to use that word, made a decision to use the word in the case of the Armenian Genocide as the, Armenian, uh, as the American ambassador to Armenia. Um, Needless to say, that didn't go over well. He paid a, a, a significant political price for that. But he did it because there was a moment in history 
where saying, even just, I mean, think about this, just saying something could make a difference, right? It wasn't about military action. It wasn't about, you know, trying to figure out how to get $10 million for something. It was being in a position to understand that by saying a word, you could create an ethical situation, an ethical challenge that wasn't just about Armenians. Um, I don't know if he, he would say that, and I know it's here, maybe he can uh, address that, but was really about how the US as a government addresses the reality of mass violence, right? It was, it was a challenge. It was the legacy of Morgenthau, for those who know uh, Ambassador Morgenthau, right? It was the moment where somebody, you know, we talk about speaking truth to power, it was the moment where we use Lemkin's word. And in doing that, it changed. It actually changed. Maybe the biggest change was among Armenians, I have to say, where people actually felt for the first time somebody was standing up to, to acknowledge the history in, a, in, a, in, a, you know, in an official way, as long as he was able to keep the post, which, of course, uh, uh, was not long after that because he did break ranks. But in an official way to actually acknowledge that this happened. So that's another example, right? It's not, it, it looks like something that, you know, I mean, it took a huge effort, it took plan, it took thought, it took commitment, it took a, a lifetime of, of ethical development to get there. But it wasn't about some world-changing military intervention, anything like that. It was about knowing the moment and doing something decisive. So these, this is where I'd like to end, that the lesson of, of Lemkin that we can take is that we are in a position to do something about genocide. It seems daunting. Okay? It took Lemkin decades to get a law against genocide. It took, you know, it's taken the world half a century to begin to deal with genocide, right? These are lifetime commitments, but making that commitment and just keeping that commitment, you know, I may not see it, but some of the younger folks in here in 50 years, maybe we'll have a genocide-free world, right? Because of the things other people in this room are doing now that we've done in our lives. We have to do this stuff these kinds of acts in the hope that we can change the world, even if it takes a century, right? If we give up and don't do them, the world won't change. We know that, right? If Lemkin didn't do what he did, the world would be different. I don't often think one human being makes a difference. I think it takes a lot of people together. In that case, that guy had a huge impact. Um, he wasn't alone, but he was a key linchpin. And without him, the world would be different. But his impact, has come decades, half a century and more after he died. We're still seeing that impact. He didn't live to see it, but it's there. So I wanna leave you with that. Think about what your impact is gonna be in 100 years or 200 years by what you do about genocide today. Thank you so much for your attention and bearing with me in a longer than expected uh, talk. I appreciate it. I don't know if we have time for questions or comments. So thank you.